As your textbook point, properties is uh, the idea of the rights of the accused. A number of the Bill of Rights are things, procedures whereby there's going to be a system of law and how that system of law was going to work itself out. So the Third Amendment said that the government wasn't going to put soldiers in your house during peacetime. The Fourth Amendment said there won't be illegal. So amendment says there is, as we saw, eminent domain, but the Fifth Amendment also said there wouldn't be self-incrimination. Uh, the Sixth Amendment said there's a right to a speedy trial. The Seventh Amendment says with a civil trial that there's going to be uh, uh, an actual jury if it's a large enough amount. And the Eighth Amendment said there's not going to be cruel and unusual punishment. And so what we want to do is take a look at how this process of the rights of the accused actually work. We talked about it in terms of selective incorporation, but we also want what sort of um, civil liberties are protected or, or not protected in our system. And the textbook actually does a really good job, so I can't replicate everything that's there, but I will send you to the textbook to take a look at their, their description of, of different parts of um, the, the Bill of Rights. Um, but one thing I do want to bring up is the idea of the terminology, actually the idea of rights of the accused versus letting guilty people go free. When I say rights of the accused, some people argue that I'm a bleeding heart liberal because it's arguing that we know that we're saying that some scumbags are, are going to get off or are going to get free because, um, you know, of a technicality or something like that. Um, but there is really underlying this a larger philosophical discussion. We often think of it as, as kind of funny when you when you have and, and you've seen kind of sketch comedy shows talking about this. The idea that the media must be sort of coy and pretend like someone hasn't actually committed. And they talk about this accused person, and they could even have on there that a person is caught with, red-handed with a knife and it's red-handed because they have blood on their hands, and they've written in a journal in blood, "I killed this person," signed by me, and all of those things. You still have to say the alleged murderer, and we talk about that as, as being something that obviously murder is not funny, but it's pointing out the absurdities of of the use of, of saying this, that you're just accused of it. But the larger idea when you say rights of the accused is turning around and saying that they may be accused of something, but there might be parts of the puzzle we don't understand. And what we need to have is this entire system, a jury trial, a, a trial by to know that in fact the person who was accused of the crime has been treated a particular way. We know that the evidence hasn't been seized illegally, so there hasn't been an illegal search and seizure. We know that there hasn't been torture that was done, and we forced a confession, so the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination has been um, protected against. The Sixth Amendment right to a speedy trial, and unusual punishment, all of those things added together is this rule of law. It's that rule of law that a lot of the framers of the U.S. Constitution were horrified by, that Daniel Shays would turn around and take it into his own hands during Shays Rebellion and stop judges from actually having the trial. And so in some ways this terminology matters. In some ways it might seem to be quaint to say, oh, this alleged victim or something like that. But in many ways, talking about uh, not the alleged victim, the alleged perpetrator, the idea of rights of the accused is an important. A person is only guilty if they've been proven guilty by um, this jury, uh, a, a trial by jury. Um, the idea as well is, however, is the fear that people have is that there are people who seem to be getting off with uh, lighter sentences they should or because of technicalities. And these are people who we know deep in our heart have actually done it or the experts, the police have said. We know this person. We caught them red-handed and yet the prosecutors weren't able to throw them away. Um, and so in that sense, the idea of guilty is that an expert, a police officer, a prosecutor knows in their hearts and from their expertise that a person is guilty. Um, and there is something to be said for expertise, but at the same time, there might be other biases that would argue that a police officer or a prosecutor, quote unquote, knows that someone has committed a crime or not. It might be because of racial animus. It might be because of gender bias. It might be because of religious bias or things like that. And they say that it's in their expert opinion. Um, and so for many, and myself included, we talk about the rights of the accused because it is that a person is not guilty and cannot be called guilty until they've been found guilty by a system that is fair. And if the system is fair, it should be able to deal with cases that even if it is clear cut and the person is red handed, has a knife in their hand with a bloody knife, they should be found guilty of the crime because the evidence could be provided in, in the court of law and then they would be found guilty and then we could turn around and say, yes, they are scumbags who committed this terrible crime. Okay, so that's just partially a, a discussion of, of some of these things. We're going to talk about another philosophical one. We talk about rights of the accused and the war on terror in a few minutes. Um, but I want to go through and talk a little bit about some of the important uh, rights of the accused. And the most important one starts in Mapp versus Ohio of 1961. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, headed by 
a Republican, headed by uh, Earl, Justice, Chief Justice Earl Warren, who was appointed by Eisenhower. Eisenhower was a Republican. Eisenhower was a traditional Republican in terms of law and order type. Put on Chief Justice Earl Warren. Earl Warren was someone who was um, a former prosecutor. He was a former governor of California. He was in the court to be one to stand up for these values of um, law and order. And so it was a bit of a surprise that he led in a number of these decisions. He led to the application and the selective incorporation of parts of the Bill of Rights, of the rights of the accused, to the states. And the first one was Matt versus Ohio. And that is the Fourth Amendment uh, freedom from warrantless search and seizure. That was incorporated in that important ruling. And in that ruling, and, and what I would have you do, I'm not going to take the time here, but I will send you to Wikipedia. Wikipedia actually can be useful as long as you don't cite it in a paper or things like that. Um, Wikipedia can have some useful information about the facts leading up to the case of Matt versus Ohio. So with all of your free time this summer, I suggest you go take a look at that just to get some of the details. And just to tantalize you, Don King, the boxing promoter, is actually part of Matt versus Ohio. So take a look at that. Um, it, it's worth taking a look at. But the larger idea of Matt versus Ohio and, and the story behind it um, that will just sort of not talk about here is the is the creation of the exclusionary rule and what it does is set up a clear dividing line that says that if the government has actually gotten a warrant has gone in front of a judge has gotten a warrant in order to search someone's property then they can go ahead and do that and that warrant will usually stipulate where they're going where the police are going to be looking what sort of things they're looking for is it going to be computers is it going to be only things in plain sight are they going to go through the dressers things like that and it is that they have presented the case as far as they have it to a judge an impartial judge and that judge then makes a decision based on the evidence that they see of whether or not there is probable cause not beyond a reasonable doubt but there is probable cause that it is worthwhile for the government to go in and violate someone's uh, privacy, in part privacy, because we know that privacy is in part from the Fourth Amendment. And so what the exclusionary rule does is establish a clear dividing line that says that if there is a warrant, then the police are allowed to go in. If there's not a warrant, on the other hand, then they're not allowed to, and any evidence that is actually taken from a warrantless search and seizure cannot be used in a court of law. And if that's the only evidence that would actually convict someone, if it is the diary written in blood that says that this individual has confessed the crime, and that's the only evidence that you have to confess that crime, then the it might be hard for the prosecution to actually try that person. But that's the argument that says that the government should play by the rules. If they had enough evidence to suggest that they should be able to find this diary, they should go in front of a, a judge. So instead, it's taking away some of the um, discretion of the police. It's saying, look, if you have a hunch, don't just use your hunch. Don't just use your belly in my heart of hearts. I know this person's guilty. Instead, turn around and say, okay, I have enough evidence. I'm going to go in front of the judge and the judge will give me the warrant and then we'll go in. But what happened is over the 1970s and 1980s, that the society changed significantly. You had the summer of love of 1968. You have an increase in drug use. You have an increase in crime. You have an increase in protests over the Vietnam War. You have a whole number of ways in which people were afraid of the rise in crime that was going on in our society. And there was some belief, and, and there was actually some real implications. Once Matt versus Ohio was ruled, a number of individuals were released because the government did not have uh, uh, proper warrant. There were technicalities. You could have said on the warrant, you could have gone to the judge and said, I want to go to 123 North Main Street because I know where that scumbag is and I'm going to go in and, and catch them. But if there's a typo on the warrant and it said 123 South Main Street, the defense lawyer would just smugly ask and say, could you read what's on the warrant? They would say 123 South Main Street. And then they would say, well, where is the house? 123 North Main Street. And their client would then be free. And so there were people, there were scumbags, there were people who were guilty, we knew were guilty, because we actually had found this evidence and knew they were guilty, but because there wasn't a, a, a warrant for the search that provided access to that, that diary or whatever the evidence is, it then meant that they were set free. And so there were real concerns. But as you had this increase in drug use, increase in, in protests over uh, the Vietnam War, as you had an increase in, in crime and perceptions of crime, you had a lot of people who were worried about this. 
And so the U.S. Supreme Court listened to some extent to listen to prosecutors, listened to police officers when they came back and said, what we need are some exceptions. So in the 1970s, it came up with a good faith exception, which said that if the police officers worked in good faith, it dealt with those technicalities and said, look, if the police did what they were supposed to, they did go in front of the judge, but it was just a typo. If they did what they were supposed to do, then that evidence, even though technically should be thrown out, could be used in a court of law. So it's an exception to the exclusionary rule. The exclusionary rule says there's a lot of evidence that cannot be used in a case, will be excluded from that case. And so if you have a good faith exception, you allow the government to have more evidence in a case against someone. Um, in the 1980s, in 1984, because of the war on drugs, you had an even greater concern. Because of the war on drugs, there was a concern that the people winning this war were actually the drug lords, and all you need to do was see narcos or a whole bunch of shows to get a sense of, of the amount of power that there was for these different uh, cartels and, and the gangs who, who were trading in drugs. And there were real concerns that they were kind of winning um, this war on drugs. And so they added in an inevitable discovery exception. So had the evidence but didn't go in front of a judge to get a warrant, it would be okay. They could still have the warrantless search and seizure, go grab the scumbags, take all the evidence that they need, and then go in front of the judge to get the warrant. So in other words, they would inevitably have discovered this evidence had they actually done the work. But because things were so tight, because the time frame was so quick, or because, as in the movie The Departed, you might actually have someone in the judge's office who could tip, or the prosecutor's office, to tip off the drug lords that there were um, going to be raided soon. And so this was added in because it was a concern about uh, the war on drugs. But what this has done is put the police in a position where they now have to call of whether or not this is a case where they should go in front of a judge and actually get the warrant, or if it's one in which they can go and get it after the, after the fact. And so it takes this dividing line, this clear dividing line. The 1961 ruling created the exclusionary rule and then changes it. And so now the government has more and more evidence that it can use in cases against people than it could in the 1960s. Okay. There were other ones, um, the textbook does a good job of talking about these, so I'm going to go over them relatively quickly, is Gideon versus Wainwright of 1963, said so they the right to counsel, the right to uh, have a lawyer. Escobedo versus Illinois in 1964 said there's a right against self-incrimination and forced confessions. That comes out of Chicago. Chicago has a long history of violence and sadly up until this day of even black sites that they have uh, been able to do a little bit of extracurricular interrogation and some say torture of, of people they suspected to be scumbags and, and murderers and terrible things. Um, but Escobedo versus Illinois said the right against self-incrimination and forced confessions would apply to the states. And this is all culminated in the idea of Miranda versus Arizona in 1966. So you have the right to remain silent. Everything you say can and will be against you in a court of law. Your right to an attorney, if you can't afford one, will be provided for you. All of those things that we know from cop shows are all put together in the Miranda versus Arizona of 1966. So the right to counsel, the right to remain silent, the right to understand these rights. Um, and it's one of those things that, again, Arizona up until that point and others are actually respecting those rights because they didn't have to. And then once this ruling came in, then all the states would have to um, abide by all those aspects of the Bill of Rights and they would have to play by those rules. And so one final thing that I would like to bring up in terms of right, rights of the accused is it's just a, a philosophical question. Originally, the question better to allow a hundred criminals go free than to punish one innocent person. And that's the argument of whether or not it's okay to have a really strict exclusionary rule, for example, in 1961 with the exclusionary rule, to say that, look, what that is going to do is to make sure that the number of innocent people who are put into jail is kept really low. And if that's your goal, then, yeah, you're probably going to let some guilty people go, people who have committed crimes that aren't actually put in jail and punished for them. But if you think that society is a better place where we allow more indi fewer individuals who are innocent to go to jail, then you might have to give up and, and, and know that there are going to be some criminals who are actually going to go free. Um, and so that was the original. And the exact numbers don't matter if it's 100 or 1,000 or 10 or 1. And people philosophically can be on either side of that debate. I'm not telling you you have to be on either side. Both ways have some legitimate concerns and, and support. And so it's just thinking about that. On which side do you fall in terms of are you one who tends to think that there should be uh, more protections for innocent people being unjustly um, convicted or even accused of a crime, 
or do you want to make sure you, you catch as many criminals as possible? And if you do so, you might catch some innocent people along the way. But nowadays, there's going to be, some people have argued that the calculation has changed because of the war on terror. Because now we're talking about, is it better to allow 100 terrorists go free than uh, to punish one innocent person? And so some people argue that the calculation has changed because now we're talking about not just criminals, but criminals who have the potential of doing some significant harm to our way of life, but also large-scale life being taken. And so maybe the calculation was different um, in the war on terror than it is in just regular criminal proceedings. Um, and so what this is arguing is, is saying, look, this is, the, is sociology, this is political science, this is the area where there's always going to be error. There are always going to be mistakes made because these are institutions of men made by men. These are ones that are made by individuals, and as the framers of the U.S. Constitution argued, we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. People aren't angels. All men aren't angels, and therefore the institutions we create are going to be flawed. And so the question is, on which side do you fall? And Rights of the Accused is talking about what is that balancing act, and your textbook does a nice job of talking about where we are in the contemporary era. And so what I really was talking about was sort of the um, recent historical sweep of that. 